And uh, yeah, I think Jenna started the recording. Yep, I just started the recording. Uh, so Leach, are you all ready? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I was going to introduce you. Uh, Dr. Lenitra Berger is the Senior Director of the Office of Fellowships at George Mason University. You may remember her from the earlier lunch talk this semester where she discussed different fellowship opportunities. Uh, she has helped several students in our department win fellowships and honorable mentions, particularly recently with the NSF GRFP and the Goldwater. An integral part of her work is helping students from underrepresented groups gain access to these fellowships and other opportunities such as study abroad. She's the editor of a book out this past September called Social Justice and International Education, Research, Practice and Perspectives. And she'll be talking to us today about the work she's been doing with respect to the social justice side of her job. So go ahead. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'm pleased that you guys asked me to come back twice in one semester. So um, I really appreciate the invitation to speak. Um, today I have, um, I'm talking about social justice. Um, this week, every year is called International Education Week, and that is an, a national week designated by the US Department of Education and the US Department of State, where we celebrate international collaboration, international exchange, international research. Um, and given where we are as a country um, with twin pandemics of both COVID-19 and anti-Black racism, um, this is also a great time to focus on on social justice. <clears throat> so I um, edited a book this um, I've been working on it for the last two years and it came out um, this September and I couldn't have orchestrated the timing any better um, because I believe that the book really deals with some very important um, issues related to social justice and international education and many of the issues that we talk about in terms of power and privilege, who's included in conversations and who's not, how are disciplines, um, individual disciplines organizing themselves around social justice, all of these issues are addressed in this book. And one of the chapters that I think um, could be really interesting for, for you is a chapter written by um, <clears throat> a man named Aaron Clevenger, who's the Dean of International Studies, I believe, at Embry-Riddle Co Aeronautical College. Um, and so he talks about how to use a social justice framework to, um, to support students studying in STEM fields um, and how to design programs that help students in STEM fields both engage internationally, but also talk about social justice issues. Um, so there's a lot of things in the book that I think are relevant. And today I'll talk to you about some of the main themes of the book and um, show you just some, some resources that, um, that are available, including an article that came out today that um, I think is directly relevant to, to STEM um, students and social justice. So, um, so, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. But First, I actually wanna hear from you all as the organizers, because I was so intrigued by the idea of Spectrum and the work that you're doing. And so it would really help me in my remarks if you could just tell me a little bit more about this organization, what are its goals and why you founded it in the first place. Uh, so I can start. So uh, Kat and I are co-founders that are here. And then we also have Natasha and Carly who were I think on the email that you got. Um, and basically we started this past uh, spring with the, we drafted a code of professional conduct after witnessing and experiencing some issues in the department related to racism, sexism, homophobia, and stuff like that. Um, and so we basically brought that to the faculty. They approved it. It's on our website. It's on syllabi and everything now. And during that first meeting, there was about six of us there, and we just kind of kept brainstorming different ideas of things that we could do and things that would help us and would help other people that we wish that we had when we were in undergrad and everything. And so we're trying to basically make those initiatives. Now, one of them is this lunch talks. Um, one of them is we have a mentoring program that we've started. Um, we have we did a bias and inclusion training earlier in this semester. Um, we have regular just like spectrum events on like imposter syndrome and things like that. Just kind of just to talk more about the stuff that people aren't usually talking about in STEM. That's that's wonderful. Um, the, that kind of activism is is important. It's relevant, and it, it really makes a difference in in now, both now for you and your current current cohort, 
but for many students for many years in the future who will come after you for their ability to be able to come to a department where they feel as though they can receive mentorship, where they can pursue their academic interest, where they can thrive as students, um, that kind of work um, lasts for a very long time. So I'm glad to hear that you as students saw that you um, that there were deficits, that there were issues, that you had concerns and you spoke out. That's usually the way um, movements start is with young people saying, um, I want something different. So um, thank you for giving me that example and, and, and sharing that with me. I, I really appreciate it. So, um, so my talk today is looking at um, you know, this bigger theme of social justice and you know, why, why it's so important for us to be talking about this now. If you are st have started this group and have made such great progress even since the spring, I think you already have an idea of, of the momentum that you need to keep these things going. Um, but you know, it's never, you can never ask for a call to action enough. Um, people need to constantly hear that this is not passive work, that it's active work and that you really need to on a daily basis get up and say, what am I going to do today to work against racism, sexism, ableism, homophobia, you know, of all of the isms that keep people from being able to fully participate in academic, cultural, social, political life. So that's a daily commitment that one has to make in order to be able to do this work. So today, um, you know, you're, you all are doing a lot of great work, but what I want everybody to do on this call is think about what are some, what is one specific thing that you can do today or tomorrow um, to, to advance some of the, the relevance of this work in the, in the sciences, in your field, particularly in physics, but also, you know, generally in STEM. Um, one of the common mis misconceptions is that, you know, I hear a lot of people in STEM who say, well, it's, you know, the sciences are objective fields. And so, there's, it's, there's no way that there can be racism um, or sexism because we're all, we're all about objectivity. Um, and as we know, um, that, that, that is not true. That is patently not true. Um, we have seen um, horrendous cases of, of people being discriminated against or just simply not what happens when you're not included in a study or on a project, when there's a, a lack and an absence of, of all voices and perspectives, what the results are. We see that with COVID, um, where black and people of color are disproportionately affected, but they're not often included in trials. So it's unclear to scientists how these vaccines really can work on people of color. It's unclear how the virus may function differently um, with people of, of, of different racial backgrounds or different genetic makeups. And so this is a glaring gap. Um, and we also have this, um, this racial and ethnic disparity in who's affected by the virus. Um, so that's, that's one thing that's, that's important to keep in mind. Um, I don't know if, if you all are aware, but for a very long time, um, you know, schools were segregated, universities were segregated, and disciplines were segregated. So um, just because there was um, there were physicists on, on predominantly white campus who, who were operating doesn't mean that there were not physicists operating on like historically black college campuses, for example. But the, those black physicists um, and those black scientists often had their own organizations. They still had a need to, to confer and convene as, as with their colleagues. And so even though they were excluded from those predominantly white, um, those white organizations, they still organized. And so um, there, the vestiges of segregation still exist in that way, that there are um, associations of scientists um, that, are, that were created during segregation and still persist. Um, those are important groups because those groups are longstanding. They have created their own culture. Um, they are committed to the success of people who are often marginalized. And um, they, you know, they serve a very important purpose in nurturing um, talent for people of color. But a lot of people don't know that those that, that there are, we're living in parallel worlds even now. 
um, and that there are still um, um, segregated um, groups because um, of our long history with, with racial segregation. Um, I can give you a personal story from my um, family background. Um, my family has a history of type one diabetes. Um, I do not have type one diabetes, but um, all of my aunts and uncles and many of my cousins and my grandmother all had type one diabetes. And type one diabetes was very difficult to regulate and control um, until very recently, actually. So if you had diabetes, it was difficult to acquire the insulin. It was difficult to test your blood sugar. Blood sugar testing wasn't really even common. Um, and even still, you had to have access to those resources to be able to do that. So um, people had a lot of um, the, the side effects of diabetes that we don't see as much anymore, um, like um, limb amputations and other, uh, other um, complications, simply because the, the technology and the access to resources was not common. So that was across the board for most people um, until until the last few decades, but it was particularly acute for black people um, because there, there was not access to medical care and hospitals were segregated. And so um, you, if you went to a, what was called a colored hospital, um, there were fewer doctors, there, there were fewer beds, there were fewer resources, um, and they were actually quite dangerous places. Um, many people got infections there, they um, did not have access to the same level of care and they died in those hospitals. So a lot of people were afraid to go into the hospitals, um, into colored hospitals. And so my grandmother had type one diabetes. Um, it was not properly regulated and she had um, an infection in her toe that developed into gangrene. And the, the, her foot needed to be amputated. But in any situation, even now, a foot amputation is a very serious surgery. There's lots of risk of complication. Very often, if a foot is amputated, it, it, you have to continue amputating it um, to get ahead of the infection. But she was refused to be treated at a colored hospital because she thought she would die of something else there. So she did die. She died at the age of 43, which is the age that I am right now, um, because she refused to go to a colored hospital. So, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, the, the really um, terrible and unfortunate history that we face as a country. And not enough people are aware of those, those disparities, particularly as they relate to medical care, as they relate to the STEM fields. Um, and so I'm glad that you invited me to talk today because I think it's just, it's really important that we understand how we got to where we are. And it sounds like your organization was started because you looked around and not only did you see, you know, examples of people not being treated equitably, but there's probably a lack of representation. Um, I'm sure that there are not, not as you're not at 50 50 parity in terms of gender representation and probably not in other ways in terms of racial ethnic minorities and other other things. And so there are very, very good historical, political, cultural, social reasons why you see underrepresentation in your field. And it's important that you think about why that is and then commit to, um, to reaching out to people and to broadening the umbrella and, and making sure that people, anybody who wants to study in your field and who wants to contribute to the scholarship has that opportunity. So, um, you know, the, this has been a very difficult year, um, which is why we're all on Zoom. And um, I'm, I, you know, would love to hear during the discussion about how COVID-19 has affected your ability to do laboratory research, since um, I know that a lot of your work occurs in labs and the university has a lot of stringent um, um, protocols now. So if, if you can't do your lab research, you know, how does that how does that impact you? You can't, you know, crash particles together in your house, for example. So, um, you know, I, I, I want to know, you know, how, how that's been affecting you. But, you know, in addition to COVID-19, we've seen this summer some of the most horrendous and horrific examples of police violence against Black people that we've seen in a very long time. 
the murder of George Floyd by the police was was a 21st century lynching. And so, um, you know, this is the, the kind of thing that people thought was in the past, many people thought it was in the past, but as we see now, it can occur to any black person at any time. And so imagine living your life thinking that at any moment it can be taken away by a police stop or by, you know, somebody who's in your neighborhood who just thinks that you don't belong there. Um, that is the additional work that a lot of black people have to carry with them just throughout their daily lives. Um, so, you know, we see now that racism is not just, you know, a white man wearing a Klan hood living in the South and burning crosses. That's not what it looks like. Um, it, it looks like a lot of different things. It looks like somebody who may refuse to promote you because you're a woman or because you're a person of color. Um, it may be someone who thinks that all Latinx people are only work service jobs. That's, that's what racism looks like. That's what white supremacy looks like. Um, it's people who are of Asian background or descent who are discriminated against because people blame them for bringing COVID-19 into the United States. Um, there's a lot of different dimensions of what this, what this looks like. And it, it's important that this summer we finally recognize that um, and, and, and call, call it out and really talk about it. So this is a really important time for us to be talking about social justice. Um, what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna open up with a reading of the introduction um, to my book to give you a sense of what the book's themes are. And then there's three basic um, concepts that come from the book that I wanna talk to you about um, in more detail and then we'll have um, discussion. So this is the, the first part of the introduction that I wrote for the social justice book. During the 1930s and 1940s, German Jewish scholars were expelled from their academic posts in German universities by the Nazi regime. Becoming refugees and in danger of being deported to concentration camps, many academics pleaded for asylum in the United States and requested teaching appointments in American colleges and universities. Many universities did not offer these scholars positions and the scholars were denied entry into the United States. The exception was a group of historically black colleges and universities or HBCUs, institutions that were founded to educate the sons and daughters of American slaves. HBCUs offered teaching positions to approximately 50 German Jewish refugee scholars in fields ranging from mathematics to visual art. Part of the core educational mission of these institutions was to address social inequality and work towards racial justice. Administrators at HBCUs saw an opportunity to extend this commitment by welcoming refugee scholars to their campuses. Merging international education and social justice ideals led to extraordinary results. The Jewish scholars provided HBCU students with a high quality education and the students could not have, that the students could not have accessed elsewhere in the United States. Shocked by the segregation and racial violence in the South, Many refugee scholars observed chilling parallels to the anti-Semitism they left behind in Europe. Some were compelled to encourage students to resist racism by protesting segregation laws and participating in the civil rights movement. In this case, HBCUs set an example by providing refuge to German Jewish scholars who in turn taught black students to use their critical thinking skills to challenge white supremacy. So that's how my book begins. Um, I'm very interested in this um, history because not very many people understand there are we're, we're aware of this important moment. Um, many of the STEM disciplines at historically black colleges and the departments were founded and, and supported by these German Jewish refugee scholars. So many the, the early generations of black physicists and mathematicians and engineers were taught and inspired by these refugee scholars. And so to me, that is one of the, the quintessential examples of, um, of HBCU success, but also of social justice as it relates to international education. Um, and so we, we know, and, and you know, as scholars that it's international exchange is an important part of scholarly research. Um, I know that there, there's a very famous institute at CERN in Switzerland. I've had a couple of Mason students who have done research there. 
Um, and so, you know, the, the history of international collaboration in the sciences is almost stronger than it is in the humanities and social sciences, where we typically think that this occurs. So, um, you know, I want to encourage you all to really um, delve into and celebrate those international collaborations and then think about, you know, that social justice implication that goes that goes along with it. So in my research in this book, and, um, and my general research as an art historian, I focus on paradoxes um, and how you can take a paradox and turn it into a paradigm shift. So, you know, there are conundrums in our lives that we seemingly can't solve, but we sit with. And oftentimes we feel that we just have to sit with them, that we just have to accept them. But in my research and in my work, I see that it's more productive to take those paradoxes and do something about them, to turn them into paradigm shifts and change the way a field or a, a community thinks about a specific issue. Um, and so one particular example um, that I work on in my work as a fellowship advisor is with the Fulbright program. And I've had a couple of physics students apply to do research through the Fulbright program. Um, the Fulbright program is our nation's preeminent, most, um, most valued and revered international exchange program. And it was founded after World War II precisely to, to promote mutual exchange between students and scholars so that we could hopefully avoid World War III, avoid nuclear war and, and build peace. Um, it was a, a visionary idea that 75 years later has produced thousands of, of Fulbright grantees um, produced a lot of scholarly collaboration and, and is a coveted opportunity for students. And ho hopefully, you know, I'll talk to some of you after, after this about the Fulbright experience because it is fantastic. But the paradox for me is how did someone like Senator J. William Fulbright have the vision for this type of program in the post-war period while at the same time signing the Southern Manifesto and not believing that he, he should or would ever want to share something as basic as a water fountain with a black person. So how does mutual exchange become so important as an overseas exercise, but shouldn't exist at all as we think about people who are part of our own communities. So that to me is, is a paradox that, you know, at George Mason, we are turning into a paradigm shift. So someone like J. William Fulbright would have never imagined the numbers of particularly students of color who come from George Mason University and get Fulbrights. That was not in his consciousness in the 40s. This program was not designed for those people. Um, the program wasn't really even designed, you know, for, for, for women to participate early on as well. So, you know, how, how can we take this um, paradox and really push for change and push for inclusion? And so this is, this is the essence of my work. So I'm gonna share three ideas with you today that we can talk about in the Q&A that come from the themes of the book. There are scholars, practitioners, um, community activists who have contributed to this book and they are writing about social justice in a lot of different ways, but there are three big themes that they all touch on in one way or the other. The first theme is power. Um, and power decides who has privilege. It provides a dominant view of social identity and hierarchy. And most importantly for this discussion today, it determines systems of knowledge. So who gets included in narratives, what are the patterns of selection and emphasis? Who gets to do research? Who gets to participate in labs? Who gets tenure? Who gets to publish? Um, and so power differentials lead to the underrepresentation that you all have seen in, in, in your field. Um, certain people are excluded. Certain people don't have access to opportunities. And then if they get those opportunities, um, there's a, usually a much higher bar set for them. Um, and a much lower threshold for failure. So if they make one mistake, then you know they are seen to be incompetent, not in as intelligent, not worthy. Um, and so this, this is a, a really important thing for you to keep in mind and think about in any situation. What are the power dynamics? Um, who has power and who doesn't and why? Um, when you are in a position of privilege, 
Um, how do you use that privilege? Uh, do you understand that privilege can shift depending on the situation, depending on, on where you are? That um, occurs a lot in, in, in international collaboration. So you may not be privileged here in the United States, but if you go overseas to another country um, as an American citizen, if the, the currency is more favorable to you, then all of a sudden you have privileges that you didn't have here in the US. And so what do you do with those? Um, those are things that, that you should think about in terms of privilege. Power, power and privilege, they're relative, they shift frequently, um, and um, you have to be willing to challenge those, those dynamics um, whenever you can. Point number two is um, the idea of comfort or discomfort. Um, yesterday, I had the, the privilege of interviewing um, Michelle Norris, who is an NPR correspondent for an event that I did on social justice. And she spoke extensively about the importance of feeling uncomfortable or feeling some level of discomfort in order to have real and meaningful conversations about racial justice and change. And um, to me, I think this is a really important idea and it really has a relevance to higher education. A lot of students think that there's a transactional nature to higher education. So you pay your tuition and you get certain things. And what I've noticed in my work is that a lot of students feel as though when they pay their tuition that that's, it's, it's giving them um, that they should have a, a smooth, smooth time in undergraduate, that they should not be challenged, that they should not be made to feel uncomfortable when that's really not the point of, of an, a higher education. Um, this is an important time in your lives where you are in probably the most diverse setting that you'll be in with the most um, number of people with PhDs, um, people, the opportunities to, to expand your mind by attending talks, by going overseas, by participating in research. And you really need to challenge yourself and, and experience discomfort in order to be able to grow. And, and to be able to, to understand other people's experiences. And you know, to me, comfort is directly um, connected to power and privilege. Some people have the privilege of feeling comfortable. Um, they are able to, um, to live lives where they're not racially profiled in stores, where they don't have to worry about being pulled over by the police and potentially killed in a police um, interaction. Um, there are lots of ways that, that people feel comfortable and they, they don't even really recognize that. So, so think about what you have in your life that makes you comfortable and think about why it is that you have that but other people might not. In an international context, that also uh, you know, relates to you know, people who, who don't have access to the basic necessities like running water, like sanitation, um, you know, there, there's, there's an element of comfort that we enjoy in the United States. If we turn on our faucet, we know that clean water is going to come out. That's a, that's a comfort. And, you know, in the United States, we have that when other people don't. So, you know, just thinking, thinking about that in particular. Another idea relates to, um, for the graduate students out there, for teaching. So you may have you may notice that sometimes students might treat you differently than another TA or another professor, and it could be because they see you um, if you're a woman, for example, and think, well, you know, women are not really good physicists, or uh, you know, they're not used to seeing you in this type of position, and they're uncomfortable with this, and their discomfort can be manifested in being resistant to accepting your feedback to giving you lower um, teaching evaluations, um, to challenging you on exam um, questions. And so it's important that you ask students, you know, what makes you comfortable talking to me in this certain way? Really think about that. Like what kinds of things in your life or structures or, or, or things have you learned in your life that make you feel comfortable talking to a, a female graduate student differently than a male graduate student or a female faculty member differently than a, a male faculty member? So, you know, comfort and discomfort are the central piece of, of, of a, a, a higher education. And they can really drive you in terms of how you, um, how you expand your mind, how you expand your research circles, 
um, how you reach out to people who, um, who are different than you. Um, you know, I, as, as a black person, you know, I'm, I'm very used to being in the minority in almost every situation that I'm in. It's just part of who, who I am. Um, and I'm, I'm just used to a certain level of discomfort. I know that I'm going to show up in, in a place and there may not be any other black people and the group may feel highly uncomfortable, even though we all have something in common. We're all art historians, we're all administrators or whatever. But simply by knowing and seeing that I'm different, other people will feel uncomfortable talking to me. So I have to have strategies for how I'm going to go and talk to people about, you know, the things we have in common and engage with people, even though I know that um, as, as well-meaning and well-intentioned as they might be, their own um, biases, prejudices, et cetera, make it difficult for them to bridge that divide. Um, the third and final thing I want to talk about today is ignorance. And you might be wondering why I would talk about ignorance with a group of physicists. Um, but, you know, this is probably the most important thing I want to talk to you about today. I study South African art. And so my research is in South Africa. And one thing I noticed when I lived in South Africa, I go there almost every summer to either to do research or to teach, is that when I talk with um, white South Africans um, of a certain generation, so my age or older, um, most of them will say that they had no idea about apartheid, that they had no idea that 90% of the population was being forced into horrendous um, political, economic, social, cultural, oppressive situation. And um, yeah, I see this across the board. I have a couple of friends who had to go into exile because they were aware of this and they fought against it. But by and large, people will tell you they had no idea. And there's a scholar um, in South Africa named Melissa Stein who wrote an article about this called The Ignorance Contract. And what she's talking about is is are the ideas of complicity and collusion during apartheid specifically. But I believe that this is something that we should be talking about here in the United States. What she's saying is that ignorance is not just a, a lapse in cognition, like I forgot or I didn't, or I just don't know. What she's saying is that there's an epistemology of ignorance. And she describes ignorance as quote, a social achievement with a strategic value. So this, um, you know, oftentimes also happens in the United States where, you know, we can live in a community that could be very close to a community that's much poorer, much more disadvantaged, where the schools, the two different schools don't even look close to the same. And people will say, oh, I had no idea that that school didn't even have textbooks, or I had no idea that there, there was a housing project right behind me, or that people live in food deserts, you know, one mile away from me, and they can't get to supermarkets. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 the common way that she describes this ignorance contract is that you know enough to know that you don't want to know anymore. So you usually have an idea. We know that there's structural racism. We know that there's there's still segregation in this country. But but you know how how far are we going to go to really understand those dynamics and really understand how differently people live? So over the summer, there was a lot of talk about white fragility, and a lot of people read Robin DiAngelo's book, Ibram X Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist book. Um, but I believe that I believe those are those are important books to read. But to me, the idea of ignorance is the next step that we need to take and that we need to understand. So um, if you're aware that that there's discrimination or um, or segregation or um, that people are not being simply included, supported, mentored and sponsored in your discipline, and you choose to ignore it and not do anything about it, you need to understand that you are choosing to participate in, in a system of ignorance um, and that this type of underrepresentation and discrimination thrives by people who choose to participate in this ignorance contract. So, um, you know, I want you to think about 
you know, those, the ways that the, that knowledge is constructed in your own field, but also broadly. Um, I teach African art at George Mason University. It fulfills a, an arts requirement and a global understanding requirement. And so I have a lot of students from different backgrounds who take the, the class and we talk a lot about Africa. We start with looking at a map of Africa because many students, even at the college level, don't understand that Africa is not one country. It is a continent with 52 countries. And so, um, you know, when we start to get into the, the history of, of, of African art, and the first thing I tell them is, you know, I ask them, you know, there's no class in the art history department that's just European art from zero BC to 2021. It doesn't exist. You can take a class on 15th century Florentine art. So a city in Italy, you can take 15 weeks of one city in Italy and one time period. But I'm teaching the history of an entire continent from the beginning of time to now. Why is that? And I want students to know up front what are the challenges of having to cover this much territory as a scholar and expecting students to gain a nuanced understanding of a place um, and it, you know, in this situation. And in our discussions, the students usually come to me and they say, wow, you know, I never studied any parts of Africa in school. I went to school in Fairfax County, never learned about any of this stuff. Well, I'm glad that the students are taking the class. I'm glad the students are interested. I'm most happy that students become outraged about the gaps in their own education when they take the class. But the question that I want students to ask themselves is why? Why weren't you taught that? Why do you know a lot of facts about the Hundred Years War, but nothing about ancient Egypt or anything related to Africa? Why, why is that disparity? So when we start to think more about that, we can see how knowledge is constructed um, in these ways that, that exclude people. And um, it's, it, it happens in every discipline. I think you guys have, have, have talked about that yourselves. So, um, you know, just to conclude, I want to, and I'll share my screen right now um, so that I can show you, um, there's, there's two things I wanna show you. Um, one, what I'll do is I'll put the link to this um, article in the chat so you can take a look at it. But this article came out today. Can you all see this? Yeah. Um, so um, this um, is a really great article um, by a group called Learning Scientists for Racial Justice. Have you heard of this group, anybody? Um, so, so they're talking about um, issues, how to, how to support Black students and how to overcome some of the barriers that they face in, in learning and persisting in, in the STEM field. And so, like I said, I'll put the link to this, um, this article um, in the chat so you can read it later. But um, I want to point you right now to some of the key themes. And the first one is knowledge production and learning are political, historical, embedded, and culturally situated. Um, so, you know, as again, as an invitation for you to really think about um, who your, um, how, how your discipline was built, take it apart, and then look at how it, it was built, and then think about how we can put it together to include more voices and, and more, um, more perspectives. Um, and then the article goes on to talk about, um, you know, how, how you support students. Um, it is very difficult for us to get rid of our implicit biases. They are built into us um, and we have to work very hard to overcome them. Um, and so if black people are dehumanized in the ways that they are, as we've seen this summer, it is very difficult to imagine black, especially young black children as being future physicists. Um, it is true that you know, the, the, the prison beds are determined by fourth grade you know, reading scores. So at a very early age, black students in particular are identified and put in a prison to pipeline, um, school to prison pipeline instead of you know, a, a graduate school pipeline. So thinking about how to give those, those young people 
that same spark and access to intellectual curiosity, which to me is also a social justice issue. Um, to be able to have for young black students to have access to, to problem solving and, and questioning and not just rote learning um, and you know a, a lot of really disproportionate behavioral um, types of structures for their for their schooling. So just thinking about how we can support and identify young people and really get get their, get them interested in, and, and curious about your discipline. So um, so like I said, I'm gonna put this in the, in the in the chat, but I thought that this was a really great article considering that I was going to talk to you all today. Um, the other thing I wanted to share, I should be able to share a second. Can you all see this that I, I switched my yep. um, is, are you are you aware of this the black and physics group? Excellent. Um, so black and physics is you know a, a group started you know by younger physicists. Um, but you know they are are doing a lot of great work to showcase current black physicists, but also to to um, uh, get people more aware of of the discipline in general. And so if you are doing events, um, if you tweet, if you use Instagram or social media, um, like if you do it today after this talk, please use the, the hashtag black and physics. Um, that type of social media discussion is designed not only to, to showcase the work that black physicists are doing, but to also share opportunities and information. So I think that there, there are probably some really excellent graduate students who would be happy to come to George Mason and study in your department and it would make them feel even better about coming to Mason if they knew that you had this group, for example, and that you are ready, open and willing to, to be inclusive and to mentor and sponsor young, um, young people of diverse backgrounds. Um, so so those, those are the two things that I wanted to, to just bring your attention to. Um, if I'm sure that I think that there are even sub genres of black and physics. Um, I know that for pretty much every group, there's a black in neuro, there's a black in microbiology. Um, I would really encourage you to explore all of those different groups um, to get ideas for, for how you wanna do your outreach, but also to just keep more people um, informed and aware of the good work that you're doing in the physics department. Um, I really appreciated the collaboration that I've had with physics over the years. Um, you have put forward some of our most talented and diverse candidates for awards like the Goldwater and the NSF and the Fulbright. And um, I do think that you are a, a good example of how a STEM discipline or how any discipline really is being introspective, especially at Mason, especially at this time. And so to me, there's a lot of work that to do, but I'm excited and heartened by you taking this step forward. And I think it's only going to pay dividends in the future that you are being so honest and, pro and proactive about your work. So that is the end of my, my formal talk and I'm happy to take questions. I'm gonna stop, stop sharing my screen and I will post that link in the chat as well. Thank you. We can also post that on the Spectrum website, so it'll be there later today. Great. So, are there any questions from the audience? We have a couple. I have a couple, and then there's a couple also in the in the uh, anonymous question form, which is here. If you need it, let me put it back in there. So one question that I have is just as, you know, Kat and Natasha and Carly and I are like very present <laughs> and visible and everything, we get asked by a lot of faculty what they can do. And, and we have a lot of really supportive faculty. You can see several of them on the call here right now. Um, that, but I guess there's kind of like a limit to things that they can do in the time, especially now with pandemics uh, and just everything that's going on in childcare and all sorts of everything that it's like, it's kind of hard to 
ask for so much for some things and also know what is even feasible for us to do at this time. Do you have recommendations for things that we can tell people? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I want to fully acknowledge how difficult it is for faculty members to be working virtually, trying to keep up their research and trying to manage everything. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm right there with you. I have two kids. I'm trying to keep my kids, you know, in school, trying to, you know, my students are spread out all over the country. Many of them are affected by COVID or have had economic consequences of, from COVID. And so it is very, very tough right now. Um, I'll say two things. Number one, um, I think that there is an acute um, risk of women in particular falling behind on their research or falling out of the workforce because they are disproportionately responsible for childcare and the schools and daycares are closed. So if there is a way that you can um, support a female colleague, um, either by reducing their teaching load, reducing their service, um, giving them um, additional time on the tenure clock, um, we, we don't want to go backwards at all. We're, we're still struggling to move forward, but we don't want to lose the, the small gains that women have made in the sciences um, in, 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 the, in their fields. So I think that that's one, one thing. You can be an ally in a lot of different ways. Sometimes being an ally is also just contacting the person you know is, is struggling and just offer to listen, to say, hey, is there one thing I can take off your plate today? Or if you know you don't have that capacity, say, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm, I'm, I can listen if, if you need something. Um, if, if you are ever in a position of power to be able to help someone, that is one thing that you could do is help lighten their load or help give them extra time. Um, the other issue that, that you mentioned just about faculty as well, um, again, you know, there's a huge burden um, that we're all shouldering in order to get through the pandemic safely. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, the, the little things, um, just really, you know, looking at a student, you know, who you think, if you get a sense, gosh, the student is smart, but they're just not doing well in their quizzes. I don't know, I don't know why they're, they're doing so poorly. Um, if you can contact that student, ask them to come to your office hours and find out what their issues are. Um, you might see that a very smart student is working two jobs and just can't really study because they're working two jobs or they're just stressed out because a family member has COVID or they've been exposed to COVID. What we don't want is we don't want to lose our next Nobel physics um, awardees because of the pandemic, because we simply just didn't nurture their own intellectual curiosity. Um, so um, if you can, if you can at all, just, just make that ask, that's, that's the way I do it. I, I don't have as many appointment slots as I used to have because I'm in more meetings, but I still have office hours. And so when I know a student is struggling, I just try to send them a quick note. I have all these pre-written notes in my, my drafts folder related to come see me. And then I can just shoot that off to a student. Are you okay? Can shoot that off. Um, just to be able to, to check in. I know that there's a limited bandwidth, um, but you know we cannot let this situation damage our disciplines for the foreseeable future. So um, you know we've got to work together to figure out how to how to catch everybody and keep them in in our um, our circles. And then. Thank you. And then we have another question. So most of the department research opportunities are kind of passed along through word of mouth where you have to seek them out. And that's something that I know when I was starting research, I overheard someone asking and that's how I knew to go ask. Otherwise I was just gonna fly under the radar the entire time. And I'm in grad school now, so clearly I could do it. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, uh, We've tried several different ops, several different ways of doing it, like, you know, trying to get people to promote them more widely. Some people do use a listserv, um, but it really is just a lot of like, you have to go and seek opportunities out. And this is something that was asked um, also in a, in a lunch talk a couple of weeks ago. How can we make these, like, how can we either get faculty to or just find some easy way to make it that we can actually 
make this opportunity is known and also encourage more people to sign up for them besides just the standard people that you would expect basically. Yeah, this is another good point. Um, so, you know, one of the, the, the downsides of the system, the way academia works is where you have a one or two mentors or a committee um, who's supervising you is that those people are supposed to be responsible for you learning the material in your field, but also they're supposed to be helping you um, advance in your career. Sometimes those same people are also trying to advance in their careers and it's, it's just hard. It's hard to support yourself and keep yourself afloat and help all of your students who come to you with different levels of understanding and interests and abilities. So um, this can be this can be a really big issue that the students who maybe are third generation physicists, you know, they know that that you do these things to, to get to where you need to go. Whereas a, a equally a smart young person who doesn't have that same access to cultural capital or resources might just have no idea where to start. And so um, what I think is important is what you've done. So you've, you invited me to come in August or September to, to speak to the group about some opportunities. And that was a way for all of your students to get to know about these opportunities without each individual advisor having to sit down and explain them. Um, but, you know, this is something that I'm working on as well. As you know, I didn't always advise undergraduate graduate students. I, I usually did undergraduates and Kay Agustin did graduate students. Um, so now I'm doing both. Um, and one thing that Kay Agustin did that was really great was she has a website with a lot of different pull down menus of, of resources for graduate students. I would like to really expand on that website and really make that um, the go to place for graduate students to be able to find opportunities. And you know, when that project gets off the ground, um, I'll come back to your department and ask if there are specific opportunities or if you want to um, there'll be a section that will have, you know, kind of advice from graduate students on how to go about uh, approaching those opportunities. We can put that in that place so that that knowledge then becomes shared knowledge and not just rest with a few people who are already in the know. Um, but that is absolutely a, a concern and what leads to underrepresentation is if the knowledge pipeline is very narrow and not enough people know how to take advantage of the resources. So um, this is something that, that I'm working on for George Mason, but is, is a general issue with graduate education that can make it difficult for a, all of the students to be able to access the fellowship opportunities. Um, we had a question come in through our anonymous form. So I think this is in reference to when you were mentioning context about not being aware of your surroundings. Um, someone was asking about what you meant when you said kind of like folks located in a food desert not being able to access grocery stores and things like that. Yeah, okay. So, um, so a food desert is a place where um, there's a community that has very little to no access to food resources. And so that, is, that can be grocery stores, farmers markets, um, places, you know, like, like stores like Target. Um, and so there are, they are ironically, paradoxically in places where there is a, abundance, but th the community itself doesn't have a strong public transportation network. And because there are no, um, no, grocery stores um, within walking distance or bus distance, those people typically have to rely on fast food or unhealthy food, convenience stores for food. So those places charge more and the food is not very healthy. So, um, so that's, that's what a food desert is. And um, you know, examples of food deserts would be places like um, Southeastern Washington DC has quite a few food deserts. Um, the areas known um, as Anacostia, um, those are places where there's, there's not supermarkets um, and people have to take very long bus rides in order to get access to fresh food. And um, that leads to obesity, that leads to malnutrition um, and, and you know, is, is very expensive. So that's what I mean by, you know, people not, 
yeah, if you like, we, we don't see them as much um, in Fairfax or other places, but they are, they, they do still exist. Okay, thank you. With that, we're actually at one o'clock. So thank you so much, Sonitra. This was a really interesting talk. It was very helpful to get this perspective. Um, and we will definitely connect you for more fellowship things throughout the rest of the year and next year and all of that because that will also help our students a lot. So. Thank you. Thank you all so much for this invitation. I'm always delighted to speak to your group. I wish you all a good luck with your initiative, but also with your research and your projects. So I really look forward to seeing all of you again sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.